Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our 4 p.m. April 20th, 2021 study session of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I wanna thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in now and when the item is introduced, use the instruction on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to speak on your, excuse me, listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Council Member Cummings is absent. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Thank you, Bonnie. Our one agenda item this afternoon is building a green economy in the city of Santa Cruz. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you are wanting to comment on this, now is the time to call in and using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation by several invited guests, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So this is uh, item, the item today, again, is building a green economy in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, our first um, item will be to receive presentations from four leading organizations in natural environment green economy efforts. And then we will spend time uh, scoping out as a council green economy sectors of interest for application to the city of Santa Cruz. And with that, I'll go, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce this. I wanna thank Ralph and Laura and also Tiffany Weiss-West though of our staff. They've been helping me uh, with the staff reports and um, working with our, our uh, invited guests today to organize the study session. And um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce this and try to get us right into the session with our speakers. Um, the intent as outlined in the uh, staff report at the end of sort of the uh, year uh, is, is sort of a reflection from the council of, of, of a resolution that sort of expresses what, what we understand and, and sort of think our direction should be in terms of the green economy. The green economy certainly is something that you're hearing a lot about uh, and we've heard about the Green New Deal and a lot of, a lot of um, such concepts, but um, when you sit down and really think about what that is, it's sometimes hard to put in actual actionable policy uh, at a city level. And uh, I, I've done a lot of research over the last couple of months and, and a lot of cities are struggling with this right now. So um, my intent today really is to bring forward what I think of as um, the natural environment piece of the green economy. And I hope that uh, I can host later through the help of our climate action manager, Tiffany Weiss-West, a round table on the built environment green economy, which I think we are more probably aware of uh, because of its application to carbon reduction and um, various things like solar and some of those industries that have really grown out of, of this attempt to really look at a green economy and its, and its uh, benefits to climate change. Uh, my intent today is to introduce you to uh, a group of people who I think are leading the edge on, uh, leading, uh, leading the way, I should say, on um, how they're operationalizing their work for environmental sustainability and um, across sectors. So we have um, 
Nick Strongovetic, uh, and this is not in order of who will be speaking, but um, mostly because he's the guy with the wave behind him. Um, I've invited Nick Strongovetic. He's the executive director of Save um, the Waves, and he's going to be here today it's really giving us sort of a, our, our place in a global perspective of ocean conservation, um, but at a very localized level. Uh, they have a very intriguing program of setting up world surf reserves and a, a very um, ambitious goal of, of preserving a thousand uh, areas in the world that revolve around surfing as an economy and how to do that from the perspective of both stewardship but also what that means as a generator of, of uh, revenue source and benefit to the people in those communities. And he's working all over the world um, in doing this work with um, a partner, Conservation International. So Nick's going to bring a, a global perspective. Um, he'll be our second speaker. Our first speaker is Andrea McKenzie. She is the general manager of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, uh, otherwise known as OSA in Santa Clara Valley, appropriately, because she um, has been working on land conservation for the last uh, really 10 to 12 years there, Andrea, but before that in Sonoma County, and has preserved tens of thousands of acres of California. Uh, and their work is very in in intriguing because they have done revenue, uh, bond revenue driven um, measures, but also they're now turning their attention to not just preserving land, but actually looking at land that they've preserved and figuring out how that serves um, the equity goals within their communities. So Andrea will be talking a little bit about that work that they've been doing. Andrea also, also sits on um, the uh, Bay Area, is it Together Bay Area, Andrea? That's the new, uh, which is a nine county regional um, open space and cultural and equity-based nonprofit that looks across the regional park system in the Bay Area and looks at uh, sharing and resource generation and basically sort of everybody's all rowing in the same direction. And they've done some pioneering work around health and parks, uh, parks prescriptions rather than prescribing people uh, drugs, a lot of kind of different things that they've done there. It's a very enterprising group. Andrea has been um, on their board for a long time and is a leader in, in the way of thinking of parks and open space as places uh, that we all now call essential places and essential services um, through COVID. Um, next will be Reggie Knox, a longtime uh, resident here. And Reggie is the executive director of California FarmLink. Uh, he's also a pioneer in the organic farming movement coming out of Santa Cruz dating back 30 some odd years. Uh, and Reggie has really uh, revolutionized his organization, California FarmLink, into um, a program of economic development and really utilizing um, the institution of farming, which um, unfortunately in a generational way, we are losing our farmers, we're not gaining farmers. Uh, and he has revolutionized the way that um, small farms especially are able to sustain themselves um, in our urban areas and um, has really, uh, I think in a really creative way, become a community development financial institution. And he's gonna speak a little bit about that investment and impact to local communities and, and, and specifically to urban areas like the city of Santa Cruz. And then finally, Bill Henry is the founding director of Groundswell Coastal Ecology. And if any of you take a walk on West Coast Drive or spend time at Seabright Beach, um, you will see Bill's work um, and throughout the area. Bill is slowly but surely uh, restoring all the bits and pieces of Santa Cruz that are in woven into our uh, urban parks and on our beaches. And uh, he is the reason that we're starting to see seabirds starting to nest back on West Cliff Drive because he's taken out the, west, the uh, ice plant and he's put back in native plants. His focus in Lighthouse Field is sustaining the monarch butterfly habitat there uh, through working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, state parks. And he really is, I think, the Tom Thumb of, of the city of Santa Cruz in his quiet way. And he's stabilizing our environment, not just for our enjoyment today, but really enjoyment of future, um, future generations. And so Bill's work is, 
is literally on the ground and he's the, he's the person that we see change these, these little changes around us. So um, what I've tried to do is put together a group of people that can give you that perspective of community investment, uh, global impact and global uh, notice of the work in Santa Cruz, um, really strategic thinking about uh, revenue measures and what those can do and how those bolster. We just finished with our parks uh, parks and recreation study session. Um, what do those revenues do and what do they leverage and how do they benefit people in ways that we hadn't managed, managed imagined before? Um, and then finally, you know, uh, how do we support the, the values that we already have in place in Santa Cruz, um, but that sometimes get forgotten with our focuses on various other things as a city. But um, really, I think we have been we have been part of a green economy for a long time here in Santa Cruz for decades, but we don't we have not called it that. So we probably need to sort of do a little bit of thinking about it. But I think we're certainly on the way and have always been on the road of a green economy in the natural environment. And um, so I've asked these folks to give us some short presentations. My hope is then we can have some questions with them. Uh, depending on timing, we'll see if they are ready to bail and go, um, go take care of their families this, this afternoon or if they'd like to stay with us, that's great. And then I've got a few slides that we can just talk through. Really what I'm trying to do is, is get a little perspective out of you uh, as council members and then Tiffany and Ralph and, and other staff will start to kind of take this in uh, in terms of the natural environment to see uh, what kinds of um, really priorities we might put into a resolution as we work towards this um, over the next, to really towards the end of the, of the uh, calendar year. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Andrea first. And uh, I believe we've got a slideshow. Probably Bonnie, you're gonna be the driver of that. Is that true? Thank you, okay. Madam Mayor. Um, Bonnie, do you want to show them or shall I give it a shot to show the screen? You should be able to share, uh, Andrea, I think, right, Bonnie? You can share your screen, but I do have it just in case it doesn't work. Okay, great. All right, can everybody see that? We can, looks great. Terrific. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Mayor Myers and council members. I'm really pleased to be here and join you for this important discussion today. I'm gonna to be talking about how the protection and restoration of nature and natural systems is really critical to the region's uh, long-term health, economy, and resiliency. And I'll start you off with this um, quote that I found in President Biden's American Jobs Plan. I kind of cobbled together a few, few of the thoughts uh, that he laid out in, in the jobs plan that I think really captures what you're trying to do today and where we're all going. So a little bit just about my agency. Um, Donna gave a, a good overview of the Open Space Authority. Our mission is to conserve natural resources, support agriculture, and connect people to nature. And we see nature as a form of infrastructure for its many uh, important ecosystem services that support people, communities, and economies. We've been around for 28 years. Uh, we were created by the legislature back in 1993. We cover about 1,100 square miles or about three quarters of Santa Clara County. We're funded through voter approved assessments and parcel taxes that we've taken before the voters, uh, generating about $12 million a year. And I think it's fair to say for every dollar we bring in, we leverage that to bring in an additional $3 uh, for our conservation and restoration work. We've protected about 30,000 acres to date and we operate a system of open space preserves that's open to the public year round uh, free of charge. One of the other things we do is we operate an uh, urban open space and urban greening grants program that benefits nonprofit schools, the cities and the county in our jurisdiction. And one of our grantees and partners is Veggie Lucian, a nonprofit that operates a community serving urban farm on the city of San Jose's Emma Pruche Park. A veggie Lucian is working in low-income communities of East San Jose to address food insecurity and to help youth develop career-oriented skills. One of our grants is helping them to fund a joint venture with the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition that taps volunteers to deliver food boxes to needy communities via bicycle. 
Our Urban Grants Program also partners with nonprofits uh, working on urban forestry to counter urban heat island effect and to work with the county's community health clinics to connect families and individuals in underserved communities to nature through parks prescription programs. We're really working to make sure that all people have access to our open space preserves. And we've really seen, as the mayor pointed out during COVID, how essential nature is to mental and physical health. I wanna provide kind of an on the ground example of how our work is coming to fruition. Um, Increasingly, our conservation efforts are focusing on protecting and restoring natural and working landscapes that provide multiple benefits to nature and people, such as building uh, climate resilience through nature-based solutions and equity. And the model I wanna talk about is the Coyote Valley. It's one of the last valley floor landscapes that's uh, still undeveloped in the Bay Area, and it's the highest conservation priority for the Open Space Authority. A little bit about this landscape. It's about 7,500 acres on the west side of Highway 101 that separates San Jose from Morgan Hill. It's a remarkable landscape for its scenic beauty, its biodiversity, active agricultural operations, cultural resources, and significant water resources. The northernmost part of the valley that you see here in the photo lies within the incorporated city of San Jose. And the mid and south Coyote Valley lie within the county. So imagine this, uh, for decades, going on 40 years, this place was planned for development of tech campuses for 50,000 workers, 25,000 single family homes, and most recently, large distribution warehouses. Now we hope the highest calling for the significant landscape is as natural infrastructure rather than for development. And so the city of San Jose joined forces with Peninsula Open Space Trust and the Open Space Authority in 2019 to acquire the landscape you see here in the photo, about a thousand acres in North Coyote Valley for wildlife connectivity, water quality, and we continue to acquire additional lands uh, to grow this conservation network. Something that really helped us along the way is we found um, a local legislator, Ash Kalra, who authored AB 948 in 2019, signed into law by Governor Newsom, which designates the area in the orange, hat, uh, orange line there around the greater Coyote Valley, about 17,500 acres, as a landscape of statewide significance. And by doing this, it makes us eligible for bond funds, grant funds um, through the state of California. So through both outright acquisition, policy, and legislation, our goal is that Coyote Valley becomes a national model or state a national model for ecosystem services and nature-based solutions to climate change. In line with Governor Newsom and President Biden's recent executive orders to protect 30% of the lands and waters of the state and nation by 2030. One of the primary reasons this valley is so unique and important is because it provides the vital land bridge or corridor for wildlife moving between the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Diablo Range, and it's rich in biodiversity. In the north portion of the Coyote Valley lies the Laguna Seca. It's the largest freshwater wetland in the South Bay. It has tremendous importance to wildlife for migrating birds, uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems, but it also plays an important role in stormwater capture and natural flood management, which benefits the downstream communities of San Jose. It holds the last undeveloped floodplains, about 2,500 acres upstream of San Jose and contains the confluence of two creeks. This photo really shows the benefit of Coyote Valley's natural floodplains for community resilience. You can see it acting here like a giant sponge to capture and slow storm waters and also recharge our groundwater aquifers. Why is that so important? Well, in 2017, a catastrophic flood hit downtown San Jose along the Coyote Creek that caused evacuation of 14,000 people and over $100 million of damage, mostly in low-income communities. So keeping natural floodplains undeveloped upstream 
reduces the impact of flooding, which is only going to become more important in the future. This became the key to the partnership with the city of San Jose. In 2018, they put a $650 million infrastructure bond before the voters and allocated $50 million of that amount to preserve open space lands in North Coyote Valley as natural infrastructure. About 60% of the lands in Coyote Valley are still in some kind of ag production. And as the mayor talked about a minute ago, it's hard to stay in agriculture. High land values, costs of water, development threats, and other challenges next to the 10th largest city in the U.S. are making it harder and harder to stay in agriculture. So we're working with the city, the county, the state through planning, policy, and funding to try and conserve the working lands of the Coyote Valley for regenerative agriculture, food security, land access for beginning and immigrant farmers, and developing procurement agreements between local farms and the city and the county. So we can monetize that connection between uh, Silicon Valley and Santa Clara Valley. This summer, we're gonna kick off a three-year multi-million dollar master planning effort for Coyote Valley that will be holistic in nature. It's gonna integrate wildlife connectivity, water resources, climate smart agriculture, equitable public access, and eco and agritourism. I have a thought that Coyote Valley could be that location just off of Highway 101 to attract economic development opportunities that support nature-based and agriculturally-based tourism, recreation, education, and green jobs training. And so speaking of green jobs, we have an ongoing partnership with San Jose Conservation Corps. We employ their crews to perform land stewardship, trail construction, and other projects on our preserved lands. We get a lot of bang for the buck by working with the Corps, job training, education, and career pathways. We've just started an intern pilot program with the Cs that will start this summer to support workforce development with the idea that once they graduate, they will be eligible for future jobs with the Open Space Authority. And then building on that, we're in the ideation stage to create a Coyote Valley Climate Resilience and Stewardship Core that would hopefully be linked to President Biden and Governor Newsom's Climate Corps, where we employ youth from disadvantaged communities and local tribes to train the next generation of environmental stewards using Coyote Valley as a outdoor lab and training ground. One of the other things that makes this so intriguing is that we have a community college, Gavilon Community College and IBM, that both have campuses located in the North Coyote Valley and we could work with them. Uh, the mayor mentioned I sit on the board of Together Bay Area, and uh, they produced a green jobs report in 2020, conducting a survey of their public park, water agency, nonprofit, and tribal members across the 10 county Bay Area, including Santa Cruz. And they were really looking to understand how environmentally related work contributes to the regional jobs market and how sustained investment in nature-based industries can support regional job growth and provide multiple benefits to communities, nature, and the economy. So they looked at uh, job opportunities in outdoor education, stewardship, capital projects, uh, wildfire resilience, sea level rise, and flood protection, and found that we could generate 10,500 jobs by advancing 620 ready-to-go projects over those 10 Bay Area counties over the next two years. And so the report really recommends integrating climate and equity considerations in infrastructure investments with a special focus on under-resourced communities. We also work to shape policy planning and legislation at the local, state, and federal level where we're prioritizing working lands for climate resilience, water resources, healthy soils and food systems, and equity rather than development. We teamed up with the county a few years ago to produce the Santa Clara Valley Ag Plan that looks at slowing the loss of farmlands to development as a climate change mitigation and greenhouse gas reduction strategy. We're also working with the cities and the county 
to integrate nature-based solutions into city and county climate action plans, including Climate Smart San Jose and the Santa Clara County's Office of Sustainability. We're working with regional transportation agency, VTA, to mitigate the loss of agricultural lands to highway and expressway projects. And we're working with uh, the city of San Jose to update their general plan four-year review to change the land use designations from industrial commercial in Coyote Valley to open space agriculture and help uh, realize our conservation vision in Coyote Valley and shift that landscape into a nature-based economy. And finally, um, we're working with our partners and representatives in Sacramento to support various state bills that are supportive of agriculture for food security, climate resilience, ecosystem services and jobs, green jobs. And that includes a Robert Rivas's AB 125, there's a $3 billion bond to support regional and more equitable agricultural systems. AB 30, which improves access to nature for all with an emphasis on disadvantaged communities. And of course, the respective Senate and Assembly climate bonds. So I wanna thank you uh, for your time, council members and Mayor Myers. And um, I hope some of what I've talked about today will um, uh, get some ideas and creative juices flowing and I'm looking forward to any conversations that you would like to have. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, we'll hold all our questions maybe till everybody's um, uh, presentations have gone through, uh, and then we can just, again, have a conversation after this. Next, I wanted to introduce Nick Strongkovetich. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Save the Waves Coalition. Nick, Great. welcome. Thank you so much. And he's a resident of the city of Santa Cruz. Oh, wait, I, I'm sorry. I, I Thank you so much, Mayor Myers. <laughs> I, I get too colloquial around here, so I apologize for that. And thank you, um, all council members, for, for the time and the opportunity today. I'm going to share my screen, or at least attempt to. Um, well, that's something new. practice this so that it can go wrong when you're doing it in, <laughs> uh, in real time. There we go. Great. Uh, so like Donna said, I'm, I'm the CEO of uh, Save the Waves Coalition. We are an NGO based in Santa Cruz and we do local work in Santa Cruz, um, but we're really uh, quite international in our work. We work in about 12 different countries. In fact, the the Zoom that I leaped over from the beyond here was talking to people in Fiji on the ground. So to give you an idea of a couple places that we work. But really, our, our whole mission is to protect surf ecosystems around the globe. Uh, we, we, we really came up with a new category of what we're protecting, but I think anybody that's spent a lot of time in Santa Cruz can really understand uh, what this means by surf ecosystems. And really, it's, uh, it's sort of the kind of these three elements that come together around a breaking and rideable wave. You have geophysical properties that make a place really unique, um, that create a breaking wave. That's the bathymetry, that's the coastal geography, geomorphology. Um, and I think Santa Cruz is unlike any other place in the world when it comes to that, because we're blessed with, I think, 26 different surf breaks, individual surf breaks between the east side and the west side. So that's a pretty significant um, sort of anomaly when it comes to uh, uh, coastal geography. But we also know, being here, that the biological component of those systems is just as important. We have these healthy and thriving, we're mostly healthy and thriving uh, kelp forests. We've got all kinds of marine mammal life that's dependent upon these really interesting ecosystems. And then we've got watersheds that have made these waves but also are really important for the terrestrial life that depends on these places. So I think the third component that again is at the core of Santa Cruz is the, the socioeconomic component of the, of the surf ecosystem. So the culture that's sprung up that's unique to the place that's dependent on the place itself, the economy that I'll talk more about that's dependent on that place, and then really the human well-being. We all know during the pandemic that um, surfing and the ocean was a lifeline for people that otherwise would really have had a hard time over the last year. And uh, 
more than just Santa Cruz found out about that. So there's a lot of people from a lot of places that came and visited here because of that well-being. And so again, the surf ecosystem, our whole mission is to protect these places that are the, the places themselves, the plants and animals and the people. So and we set this giant goal that, that uh, uh, Mayor Myers mentioned, uh, which is uh, protecting a thousand surf ecosystems around the globe by 2030. So we're supporting the 30 by 30 goals that have been um, set forth by the state and uh, federal uh, policy, as well as these international agreements uh, where everybody's sort of pulling in this direction. And so really what does it look like if we're truly effective in doing uh, completing this goal, our, our theory of change really says, if we have a mobilized constituency of people, people that care about a place, we have effective stewardship of that place, and we have some sort of legal or voluntary protected areas, that actually creates the recipe for long-term healthy protected surf ecosystems. And I think that we have that in Santa Cruz. I think one um, important uh, component of our work is we don't do anything alone I can't think of one project that we've ever done where it's just been saved the way it did this project and we declared, declared victory and it was great. We do everything in coalition. So we build coalitions to solve these problems and build coalitions to tackle sort of the protect, steward, and defend um, strategies. So these are our three strategies, protect, steward, and defend. Again, creation of voluntary and legal, legally protected areas. So I'll talk about our more voluntary ones, which are world surfing reserves, but we also have a series of uh, legally protected areas that we're creating largely outside of the US um, that are called surf protected area networks. So we're working in Mexico, we're working in Chile, we're working in Indonesia. We just started working in the Azores and the Maldives. Um, we're working in a number of other places that are, are, are coming up as well, Costa Rica and uh, part and parcel of this is due to the, the partnerships that we formed. So uh, Donna mentioned a, a large strategic partnership with Conservation International. Again, we have a number of smaller partners in each of these places as well, and it goes back to the coalition aspect of what we do. Um, and I'll talk more about the, the world surfing reserves uh, in detail, but that's the other component of this strategy. Uh, so stewardship is another really important component, as we mentioned. Uh, this is sort of a technology platform in the form of our mobile app, and then projects that we do um, when you can't legislate against something or create laws or a protected area around things like non-point source uh, water, you know, uh, water quality contamination like we saw towels, or this happens to be a shipwreck in uh, Mexico off the island of Isla Tos Santos. So sometimes you just need people to maintain and steward a place. You don't need to legislate something or create a, a protected area framework. Um, and a really good example of this locally that I think has been uh, you know, an enormous source of pride for us and, and something personally that was really important to me was the Clean Cowles. Uh, Council member Tarasas a few years ago uh, launched the uh, Cowles Working Group and that was one of the more effective coalitions we've ever collaborated in. We took Cowles as a group and with tons of investment from city staff of time and resources and the council, obviously, and then our other community partners of folks uh, like at the county, um, Surf Rider, Sierra Club, we all pulled together in one direction to take cows, uh, bacteria con contaminations way down, really understand the problem and really communicate to the uh, to the public what it is. And I remember, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't want to touch cows with your foot. And now I feel like that stigma is gone and the data are getting, continued to improve. There's still work to be done, but it's just an example of sort of how we do stewardship. Um, and then we defend, we launch popular campaigns sometimes when there's a, a massive threat to a, a surf ecosystem or more increasingly in favor of increased uh, legal protection for these places around the world. Um, we sort of support a lot of this work with the economic viewpoint. We don't think we can just tell everybody about how great surfing is and it'll automatically protect itself. And we think that there's really benefits to more than the surfing community. So part of this is really using a hook and using the love and passion of the surfing community to have broad scale um, benefits for the rest of the community as well. So. Getting to the, most of the uh, pertinent discussion today, um, kind of our biggest and most well-known program is the World Surfing Reserves. 
So this is really a, a an honor, uh, a titular honor, but it also a conservation responsibility that we we confer upon a community. So we, we really identify the best, most outstanding uh, surf zones or, or waves around the world, and um, and we we identify them with kind of a series of uh, four criteria: quality and consistency, the environmental characteristics that the place has, uh, the history and culture of the place being significant, and then the local capacity and support. So all four of those we use as a cr criteria to select them. We select one per year. Um, we're up to 11, but just to give you an idea of where we are working with all this, Malibu was the first one in California, Manly Beach in Australia, um, Ericeira in Portugal uh, was the third one, uh, Santa Cruz was the fourth, so way back in uh, 2012 it was uh, nominated and approved. Juan Chaco, Peru, which is arguably the birthplace of uh, surfing in South America, some Hawaiians might dispute it, but it is significant nonetheless on an archaeological standpoint. Bayatol Santos in Mexico around Ensenada, Punta de Lobos in Chile, um, which is, uh, was subject of a big campaign we did with Patagonia, the clothing company. Um, the Gold Coast in Australia, which is host to some of the best uh, surfing in the world, and many of the professional contests stop there. Guarda do Ambau in Brazil, and then the latest ones were Nusa in, uh, in Queensland and Playa Hermosa in Costa Rica. And so I think what I want to kind of embed today is that surfing as a resource and waves as a resource is something that Santa Cruz has in spades that we probably do not link up enough with the economic development uh, and the economic potential. It's not to say we can get a bunch more people here and monetize it, but I think there's a way that we can think a little bit more strategically about it because, again, in terms of green infrastructure, it's something that you don't have to maintain. All you have to do is not screw up the perfect waves that we have here. <laughs> and I think the second point that I want to make is that the World Surfing Reserve is a tidal and an economic driver around the world that people use and significant amounts of tourism resources go to support this and, and we don't really utilize it in Santa Cruz in any sort of meaningful way. And so I think, our, again, my object here today is to just show that we have these resources here that are we can take advantage of and, uh, and really make it work. So just to give you an example of the profile of this um, program when we get outside of Santa Cruz. Uh, it's really a big deal. So this is a recent tweet uh, by the Costa Rican president, um, uh, Carlos Alvarado Quesada, about the World Surfing Reserve being selected in, in Playa Hermosa. So he basically said, Playa Hermosa, Garabito, and Punta Arenas, so it was the next World Surfing Reserve. It's the first in Central America, and it's this huge uh, honor. So again, this is the president of Costa Rica we're talking about here. Um, similarly, in the Gold Coast, um, we have the, the Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk there, Rabbit Bartholomew, who's the 1977, I think, world champion and a huge legend in the surfing world, current World Surfing uh, World Surf League commentator, and then Mick DeBrenny, who is the Minister of Sport for uh, Queensland, all there at the dedication. Right now, Queensland state legislature is taking up legislation about how to legally protect this, what they call surf amenity of the World Surfing Reserve. They, they take it very, very seriously there. It's the de facto um, body, the World Surfing Reserve Committee there is the de facto body that advises the Council of the Gold Coast. And again, it's a very huge deal. You drive along the highway and it says, welcome to Gold Coast, Australia's second World Surfing Reserve, like giant sign on the highway. So, um, and then the third one that I wanted to show, which we'll see if this works in the tech, my tech world. This is from Ericeira in Portugal, and this is their surf interpretation center that uh, is really, truly mind blowing. So this is, the municipality received uh, about 360,000 euro grant to build this interpretation center. What they've done with it is very, very cool and can be a bit of a, you know, just some another thing that some of the other communities have done. 
that shows their entire coastline, how the waves affect it, what the different swell directions are, what happens with the wind and tide, and it's all very interactive to understand that surf ecosystem. Uh, and they, they designated a whole um, component, like there's a, an entire uh, building here in Ericera that's designated to this interpretation center. So it's, it's just another thing out there that some of the other communities have done. I wanted to similarly paint a picture here of the economic impact of surf uh, tourism. This is globally, but this is a recent study that just came out by Dr. Jess Ponting and uh, Leon Mock that looked at the pre-COVID baselines of surf tourism and had a couple of different, uh, they surveyed about 2,500 people, oh, sorry, 2,000 people, a little over 2,000 people and really found that uh, the surf tourism expenditure could be between 31 and 64 billion B dollars globally, and that surfers are willing to pay for more sustainable tourism. We've also found, we've done a series of these, what we call surfonomic studies to depend, to figure out what the actual ecological economic, sorry, the ecological economic value of a surf spot is. And one of the studies we did, for example, in a place called Uluwatu in Bali, it was uh, it was projected that it generates just one spot generates thirty five million dollars of economic activity, and that left out real estate, jobs, and a number of other things. We haven't been able to do this study in Santa Cruz yet, but I think post COVID, it's something that would be very very interesting to see how it's changed and how it has grown in COVID. Because I I know during the pandemic. Um, the surf economy has done nothing but go up. And so this is something we want to be able to understand a bit better. Uh, we've had UCLA actually build us out an entire methodology. It looks at jobs, looks at travel cost and, and um, travel expenditure, and looks at the, uh, the sort of like housing valuation uh, that surfing actually contributes because we can measure that. So I think what the picture again that I wanted to paint is I think there's a real opportunity here uh, for our community to not create something new, but take, just uh, utilize in a, in a bit more of a strategic way for us to really be able to, um, that what makes our community our community. I think one, one historic kind of study that I, or one historic story that's really important is that Santa Cruz was the first place where surfing left its native Hawaiian roots. It's the first time it became international. It's the first time it became an international sport way back in 1885, right? And I think that, that Santa Cruz has also been a leader when it comes to uh, doing really cutting edge things around the environment and the economy. I think about companies like Odwalla starting here or the organic food movement really starting here. I think we have the ability to show the rest of the world that we're really leaders and that we can listen to the, the community and the grassroots of what we can what we can do in terms of the economy, but support what is already here and sustain what is already here. And that's what I think is really cool about the opportunity that's coming up. There's a few different things that we need to be able to manage around our surf resources. There's some big challenges that we're gonna have to take on, such as climate change, and that's probably the biggest threat to what we have now. So how we respond to that is really important. And I think as Save the Waves, again, we're here as a coalition. All we wanna be able to do is help um, help leverage the resources that are here and help leverage our network to support Santa Cruz. Because again, a thing I learned a long time ago, it doesn't matter if you fly around the world and you save other people's places. If you're not doing it in your own backyard, it doesn't really matter. So for us, this is our backyard and this is where it starts. So thank you guys for the time. Um, we'll take questions after and I just really appreciate everybody's, uh, everybody's interest and, and, and time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Next, I'll um, have Reggie Knox um, queue up here. And uh, as I mentioned, Rex, Reggie Knox is a long, long, long time resident um, and the executive director of California Farm Link since 2011. Um, as I mentioned, he's just brought a whole level of creativity about um, food, uh, food security across the region and um, his work is really inspiring. So um, Reggie, thank you for being here today with us. And we 
Do you want Bonnie to run your slideshow, Reggie, or do you want to That would be great. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm, I'm like you, Reggie. I'm like someone else. Run it. I can never do it. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll, I'll just I'll just say next when I'm when I'm ready for you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And um, thank you, Mayor Myers and Council members. Great to be here. Um, so so fascinating to listen to these illustrious speakers. And uh, Nick, thanks for um, queuing me up there with the comment about uh, Santa Cruz as an early uh, center for organic agriculture. And um, I think you know my thesis today. <clears throat> really kind of kind of builds on that and um, we, we were one of the first states with our own organic food act starting in 1979 and the organic food movement was developing during the 70s before that right here in the monterey bay area and in santa cruz county and um you know here we are perched next to monterey county which is the largest coastal agricultural county and um one of the top agricultural counties in the state after uh, the big the big ones in the Central Valley. And, and we ourselves have quite a significant um, agricultural economy in this small county. Um, and so we should have a strong strategic approach to the ag community here in the ag industry. Um, and one that facilitates job creation, that recognizes the ways that within our city limits, we are supporting agriculture throughout the county and the region and the whole Bay Area. Um, and, you know, develop jobs and, and, and industry that um, also leverage the, the innovation that's occurring in agriculture right now, particularly with regard to adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Um, Andrea mentioned, you know, regenerative agriculture, which is a, a big um, area of study right now, and, and carbon farming and the ability of agriculture to sequester carbon. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and and Mayor Myers, you, you mentioned, you know, food security. So really, um, as with all the changes and with climate change um, accelerating, you know, ensuring the development of a strong regional food system could be something that we participate here in the city. And so next slide. Thank you. Um, just a little bit about California Farm Link, these next two slides here. Our theory of change is really about providing access to land, capital, and education for small and mid-scale farmers. Um, we believe that these three things are the foundation of sustainable farming businesses that create and preserve wealth while conserving and enhancing natural resources. Um, we believe that successful farm and ranch businesses su support healthy rural communities and uh, resilient food systems, living wage jobs, and a healthy environment. And, and we deliberately direct the resources of California FarmLink um, and, and the opportunities and services that we provide to farmers of color and women and members of groups that have historically been denied equal access to land, capital, and education. Um, so uh, our, we focus on fair financing. We are a financial institution, um, access to land and access to education. And um, Mayor Myers mentioned that we, we became a community development financial institution in 2013. and. Uh, there are about 800 active community uh, financial institutions around the country um, that, that are certified by the Department of Treasury. And the focus of community development financial institutions is to bring capital where banks are not bringing capital, essentially into low-income communities. So as a community development financial institution, we have a target market of low-income um, small business and in particular Latinx farmers. So we've been able to develop this loan fund um, and it now uh, numbers about 175 farmers in that loan fund and $19 million. Um, uh, we, we provide farm operating infrastructure and land loans. 
Um, in particular, we, in, this year we're working hard on developing, we've been piloting diff, uh, a few pilot programs for the last couple of years, but developing financial incentives for conservation and carbon sequestration on the farms in, in this region. We are a statewide organization with about 20 employees. We have an app, uh, our headquarters is in Aptos. Uh, but we also have a couple staff in Sacramento and one in the Sonoma Marin area serving North Coast counties. Um, next slide. Let's see. Um, I, on the, uh, sorry, on the former slide, I, I missed mentioning kind of our source of, of funding. So we, we are, because we're a financial institution, we do um, have earned income from our loans in the form of interest and fees, um, where uh, our loans tend to be below market rate, and to, we make loans to uh, the, the small businesses um, that, that banks typically don't make loans to because there's a not uh, enough money in these loans, there's not enough profit in these small loans that we're making for small businesses. Um, so. We have investors that are called impact investors, and um, these include the local community foundations. Monterey and Santa Cruz uh, community foundations are both significant investors in FarmLink's loan fund. Um, we also, there's about 20 or more uh, institutions that are now invested in our loan fund. So these are low interest loans from zero to 2% that you know we, we are on the hook to pay back eventually. Um, but that's how we generate our, our loan pool. And then we also receive grants from foundations because the income from the loans isn't enough to uh, run the organization or even pay for our lending staff, which is about half of the 20 staff are in lending and the other half are in education. So um, now we can do the next slide. Thank you. Um, we also have educational programs and the one that we just rolled out this year called Programa para Asegurar Su Patrimonio Familiar or Wealth Building Program in English. It's a you know, Spanish speaking uh, educational program, eight week program, and it's similar to our English language resilience program that's been going on for a couple years now. Um, it's just basic small business development. We also work with farmers on farm succession planning and um, introducing uh, folks to, so if there's not a family member who wants to take over that farm, to possible, um, you know, member, uh, small farmers who are outside of the family. And uh, we also, in our land access program, have a web portal that links uh, farmers with landowners. So as a landowner, if you have extra land that you might want to lease out to an organic farmer, then you can post it on our website. Um, and then we provide a lot of leasing support because most of our farmers are leasing land. But as, since we've developed this uh, ability to make farm mortgages, and we've done about 30 of them now, um, we've been able to help a number of uh, small farmers initially develop a lease, often with an option to purchase or a first right of refusal, and then turn that into a, a land purchase. Um, sometimes with the help of a land, land trust, purchasing a conservation easement on that property, which makes it more affordable for the farmer if there's a purchased easement. So let's go to the next slide. Um, just a, some, some basic uh, data from the, uh, the, the crop report in Santa Cruz County, just to get a sense of the agricultural economy here. The county uh, gross in 2019 was uh, 625 million in farm sales. Um, we have 625 farms um, on 63,000 acres and the median farm size is 10 acres. So what I wanted to impress on you here was that, um, you know, most of the, small, the farms are small farms. Um, and uh, very few of them are, are the larger farms. And you can see in Monterey County, 4.4 uh, billion, this is a very large agricultural county, fourth, in, fourth or fifth in the state, um, with uh, you know, twice as many farms, more than twice as many farms. Um, and you know, 
a major agricultural industry, of course, within the city of Salinas and quite a bit in um, Watsonville, um, since the Pajaro Valley is kind of the center of our agriculture. But um, there are ag-related businesses throughout the county and right here in Santa Cruz, in the city of Santa Cruz, of course. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Just a little more about the crops here. We all are familiar with uh, you know, strawberries, which is the largest um, in terms of dollar volume in the county, and 60% uh, uh, if you include uh, raspberries and blackberries of, of all the crop value. Um, and then veggies, nursery, and, and some of the other, what they call in the crop report, $1 million crops, and this, uh, except, except for hemp, that's new. Um, but a, a crop of interest in Santa Cruz County. Um, and then it, we have a significant amount of acreage in um, and, and dollar volume in organic, as you can see here from this, from this data, with 145 uh, registered organic growers. And then um, I just did uh, looking at a couple, a little bit of looking around at some of the reports on jobs in Santa Cruz County. And you, if I got any of this wrong, please please correct me. But um, I was trying to get some data on you know farm jobs, which uh, the EDD says number five thousand five hundred in the county. Um, but then uh, the Workforce Development Board showed um, eleven thousand three hundred fifty ag and food jobs. Um, there are a lot of <clears throat> corollary jobs for agriculture, distribution, aggregation, cooling inputs, manufacturing, processing, et cetera. Um, so I think it would be interesting to do a more comprehensive look at, you know, what are the businesses in Santa Cruz that are engaged in in supporting the agricultural sector and how, how can we leverage the ag economy in Santa Cruz for, for green job creation here. And next slide. Um, one of the key elements in this arena of small farm development is marketing, of course. So direct markets are critical. Um, the Farmers Market, this Farmers Market Association here in Santa Cruz plays a very important role in helping small farmers to get started as do the other uh, farmers markets around the Monterey Bay area um, and on the peninsula. And um, as farmers, as farms grow, um, they, they often get to the point where um, if they're going to stay in business, they're, they're uh, moving on to other distribution channels. And uh, one important uh, institution in northern Monterey County is Coke Farm, which is a distributor that supports many of the um, Latinx farmers that, that we work with. Um, with our loan program and our education programs. Um, and many of these farmers are former farm workers, of course. And um, there's a lot of food emphasis on the development of food hubs, sort of new distribution models for, for aggregation of uh, product from small farms in a region. So that would be something to look at here. I have a slide that we'll see in a minute about the wealth of organic farms that are on the North Coast area and um, and even in Bonnie Dune and all around Santa Cruz, um, right up to the city limits essentially, there are farms that could benefit from, uh, you know, marketing food hubs. Uh, these can sometimes are organized as farmer co-ops. That might be something to look at for the future. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of uh, support for the Farmers Market Association, and um, and there's been uh, during COVID a lot of increase in you know interest in CSA. So what we saw with all the farmers who were working with and supporting through our loan program was that some people were losing markets. These were people that relied on um, institutions uh, or like offices or schools that were closed um, and others that business was booming and 
in particularly with regard to direct sales through CSAs, community supported agriculture, or um, of course the farmers markets um, mostly stayed open. So uh, supporting uh, the direct marketing opportunities for farmers uh, in our community is important. Uh, Andrea, you, you mentioned uh, agency procurement policies, and I think I, I don't know where we stand it, with the city and the county right now with our procure, procurement policies, but um, that would be something to look at. And we've seen many examples of food policy councils in other Bay Area communities um, that have focused on, on supporting small farms from the region. Uh, I put El Paro Community Development uh, Corporation in here based in Watsonville, which has an incubator kitchen that maybe some of you are familiar with. Uh, but this has been another, you know, food and farm related. Man, many of the businesses in, in that are taking advantage of that incubator kitchen are buying from small farms. And um, El Pavro, of course, also does small business development and education. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, we have many pioneering training and education institutions in Santa Cruz um, that support small farms. Um, the Agricultural Land-Based Training Association is a national leader and farm incubator based in Salinas, not in our community, but um, it's uh, an example to, to look at because um, they have focused on helping farm workers start their own independent farming businesses. and. Uh, Part of the way we got our start, especially with the loan program, was serving the farmers that had come through that incubator and um, were ready to start their own businesses, were looking for land, so our land access program helped them, and then maybe their first $10,000 loan leading to a $25,000 and a $50,000, and sometimes in, in you know five to seven years, we're actually seeing people buy farms, um, you know, 10 or 20 acre farms in, in, in this region, which is a very tall order. But we have very high value crops. Um, and the typical strawberry farm takes, by the way, uh, ten dollars to $12,000 of investment at the beginning of the season, and it will require, per acre, it will require 25000 20 to 25000 by the end of the season. Um, and it, it may gross five or six, sorry, net five or $6,000 per acre. So, um, we have high value crops in this area with um, high return and a you know, fairly high risk. So as a lender, we, we share that risk uh, along with the investors who are impact investors um, when we make loans to these small farmers. <clears throat> Next slide. So just uh, other important um, businesses in Santa Cruz that uh, are supporting the agricultural economy here. California Certified Organic Farmers uh, is a significant employer in town, I think with um, 150 or so employees. Um, I wanted to mention that Cal Coastal Rural Development Corporation, which is based in Salinas, but is another uh, fin financial institution, actually a CDFI as well, that um, is about 20 years older than California Farm Link and really started working with Latino farmers um, long before Farm Link did and kind of graduated onto mostly larger loans um, serving the larger uh, farms in our region all the way down to sort of Santa Maria. Um, but another you know example of a of a financial institution that worked hand in hand with farmers and in development in the ag community. Um, in terms of organic farm inputs, uh, there's there had been discussion some time ago about um, whether or not our county would be able to really step up and provide compost, um, you know, significant amount of compost production for. Um, organic farmers of the quality that they require. And uh, I, I think that would be something to take a look at again now, especially um, with regard to the farms on the North Coast and all this transition that's going on there with retirement and um, the need for succession. Um, one of the you know factors is the ability to get compost 
host on, on these farms, and that's also an important um, climate change, uh, you know, practice. Is cover crops, compost, mulch um, are all things, uh, you know, along with you know habitat enhancement around the borders of farms and that kind of thing that um, can help sequester carbon. Um, I just wanted to mention that we I, I talked a little a little bit earlier about our um, efforts to use financing to incentivize um, conservation and climate smart ag. Uh, the resource conservation districts, in particularly Santa Cruz, but many of them now um, are all working on carbon farm plans and uh, do, doing those uh, that work. So evaluating and helping farmers figure out how they can sequester more carbon and participate participate in climate change mitigation. Um, and we have the, the Healthy Soils Program, which is a state program, one of the four um, climate smart agriculture programs that has been developed in the last 10, 10 or so years at, at the state level. Um, so once a farm has a carbon farm plan, then they can apply for a Healthy Soils Grant to offset the cost of implementing a new um, you know, carbon practice like growing cover crops, for example, or applying mulch or compost. Um, there's also the Federal Environmental Quality Incentives Program administered by the Natural Resource Conservation Service that has similar cost share programs for farmers who are into, uh, would like to implement conservation measures. Next slide. Um, so I just have a, a list here of some of the interesting local, uh, well, some of the areas within the city limits that have hosted farms um, over many years and uh, other sort of community garden examples and that kind of thing. Um, you know, the first two areas within the city limits that come to mind, uh, of, course, of course, are Golf Club Drive, um, where I started farming on graduating from UC Santa Cruz back in 1987 uh, for about four years um, with the <clears throat> former manager of the UC Center for Agroecology who started Santa Cruz Farms down there on Golf Club Drive. That, that's still a, an area that um, includes uh, a couple farming businesses, Central Coast Wilds, which is a native plant uh, nursery and restoration services business. Um, as well as Common Roots Farm, which is relatively new, which uh, provides people with and without disabilities um, skills building and, and social network building and uh, opportunities for micro enterprise. So some interesting projects still going on down there on Golf Club Drive to pay attention to. Um, and then of course, historic organic farming leases on Ocean Street Extension. And then um, the Younger Ranch, which is just outside the city limits to the north, um, a couple hundred acres on that first marine terrace, um, it, it had historically been in Bustle Sprouts, but there's uh, interesting opportunities there now. Um, at many of the Bustle Sprouts growers are transitioning out and some of those leases are becoming available. Um, and then in Watsonville, I really like the examples of Esperanza Community Farm and Mesa Verde Gardens. Um, some of the same people are involved in both. Mesa Verde Gardens is, I think they have, last time I checked, which was a while ago, but they had eight sites, I believe, that were um, basically providing community gardening spots in near low-income communities for people to grow their own food. Um, and as for um, a community farm, uh, was is developing a CSA and uh, providing work opportunities for folks and distribution to uh, of CSA products at affordable prices into low-income communities. Um, and I was involved in the 90s in a, a study that we did in the Watsonville city limits called the Pajaro Valley Futures Project, um, <clears throat> where we, it was an infill study essentially, and we looked at all of the uh, vacant parcels within the city limits at that time and um, thought about and hired economists to uh, look at what the possibilities were for agriculture related development on these parcels and the idea was that this would be an alternative to sprawling out onto some of the, the uh, farmland there and that kind of led to the 
Action Power Bro group and eventually the uh, Urban Growth Foundry that is getting ready to, to um, reach its 20 year limit uh, soon. But there was a, there's been an Urban Growth Foundry around Watsonville um, to protect farmland for the last 20 years and we'll see what happens there. Um, and then I, I love the example that Andrea provided uh, for Coyote Valley. So don't have to say anything more about that. One more slide here. Um, the point of this slide is just to, you know, name some of the historic and new farms um, along the North Coast that, you know, draw their labor force from uh, Santa Cruz often and rely on Santa Cruz uh, for markets and uh, direct markets in some cases. Um, and there are some serious limiting factors to, to agriculture in the North Coast. Uh, not the least of which is, you know, affordable housing for, for labor um, and, and water. But as I mentioned, an, a number of leases of the, some of the conventional Brussels sprouts farms and some of the organic farms that have been around for 30 years now um, are, are turning over. And there is, you know, a question as to whether these will be able to continue as or, organic farms, given um, particularly the, the housing issue uh, right now. Um, I, I'm, I don't know the details of the rail trail plans. I haven't kept up on that, but there's certainly some interesting possibility possibilities there for you know rail and rail trail connections um, with the farms on the north coast. So let's see. Yeah, that, I think one more slide just to to wrap up. Um, you know, in conclusion, I'll just say I, I really hope that we can leverage our agricultural economy to create jobs in the city, and um, and it may be time to do a more detailed study of what the sustainable agricultural economy looks like now, and what are the opportunities for the city the city to take part in it. Thank you. Oh, Mayor Myers, you're on mute. Thanks, Reggie, very much. And I know I'm probably uh, testing our council members a little bit here. If you do need to get up and run to the restroom, we were in session since two, so please feel free to dip out here. But um, I wanted to introduce Bill Henry. Um, as I mentioned when I introduced him earlier, he's the founding director of Groundswell Coastal Ecology and uh, the green the, the, the green sum of, of our local parks and areas and uh, paths and trails. And uh, he uh, is coming at this from very much a, um, a community uh, place uh, of science, community art and education and um, He's just doing really neat work, and uh, so I'm really excited to have him give you a little bit about his work in some of our most important places in the city, which are Seabright Beach, um, Natural Bridges, and Steamer Lane. And uh, so happy to have Bill here. And Bill, you want to cue yourself up, or do you need us to cue you up? Here. There we go. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Myers and council members. I appreciate it. Just had to shut down the, the piano practice going on behind me here. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be with everybody here talking about doing good things across the landscape. It's so exciting to you know get to spend time with everybody that's, you know, we're all on the same team trying to build um, a better place. And so I think I can share my screen. There we go. There we go, okay. Yeah, I'm Bill Henry, I'm with Groundswell Coastal Ecology. Um, we are pretty different than most of the, organi than the organizations here today. We're very small. Um, we've been around since um, 
about 2015. And um, what we really focus on is building better places for nature and people. And um, what what I think a big part of the the goal of our organization is get that interaction going because today with the lives we leave, uh, live, there are oftentimes just a, a lack of that hands-on, that tactile, that interaction that inspires us. And there's a big opportunity, I feel, to, um, to do that across the landscape. Um, and so one of the ways we do this is by um, trying to um, work towards thriving natural ecosystems that are connected to vibrant communities through the hands-on stewardship. And that's the key component is, um, you know, as, as primates, we, we live by doing a large part. And so having that tactile, that interaction, that smell, that taste, that touch, that hear, that uh, acoustical connection to our environment um, is, is, uh, is really important to us um, um, as we've evolved over time. Um, so in in Santa Cruz, we're pretty fortunate here, right? I mean, we're endowed with um, incredible natural resources, and we're at the, the very head of the Monterey Bay, at the head of the, the indentation along our coast that's one of the most highly productive marine ecosystems in the world. Um, and, and in addition to that, we have these rich agricultural lands, forests, and abundant open space and open coastline. And these are all attributes that bring us and many millions of people here every year to um, enjoy this and to be inspired, um, inspired by that interaction. And that is something that, you know, I think it, it, it creates these feelings of introspection and it's pretty well studied, the interaction between people and nature. And, and we know that it creates um, you know, a uh, sense of creativity. And there have been some really neat studies done on that. Um, and I think there's no fault of that in Santa Cruz, and perhaps that's in part why um, we are such a stronghold of creativity and a lot of really unique um, innovations have come out of Santa Cruz. And I'm really interested in seeing how we can make that go forward with building um, with building a green economy, because I think the opportunity is there. We have all the components, right? Even just who we have here today. Um, and so where we are, we have many challenges too. And I think um, addressing uh, these challenges is an opportunity for building a green account economy here. And um, I'm gonna go into kind of three of the primary challenges I think that we have, and then maybe talk about some some opportunities there. Um, the first would be coastal adaptation, um, you know, with sea level rise, um, frequency and intensity of storms. Um, we have a um, we have a threat along our coast, especially in the areas that we've built up on and we're experiencing coastal squeeze. Um, wildfire is another one. I know, um, you know, many people on on this call or on this uh, presentation have been impacted by wildfire, and. It's a um, it's a, a massive threat um, and a massive component of the ecosystem, um, and then water security. Um, you know, we've just gone into a water shortage of stage one here, and so that's another big issue, but also an opportunity. I feel like for when we're talking about building the green economy, for building towards resiliency across these three things, and the other thing that it kind of comes into play is. Um, some other stressors that compound everything. And, you know, obviously we're all well aware of um, how intense visitorship has gotten. And it's something we all support. We want people to have those interactions between, um, you know, the natural environment and to be inspired. But we've hit this, I think, almost this tipping point of where the sustainability, the balance of access and resource, um, we need to uh, perhaps invest some energy and, and some funding in a way to make it sustainable. Um, homelessness is another uh, issue that really is compounded. Um, uh, some of the, is compounded by some of these other stressors. Um, like before, below, down on the right, that's a, a camper on the King Tide at the base of the um, at the base of the Santa Cruz War. And then we run into this thing that you know, unlike um, many communities in the Silicon 
Valley, um, we have a much lower tax base. So that that is um, makes it more challenging for us to implement solutions. Um, and so we need to find solutions to, you know, to the primary challenges, but also to accommodate some of these additional stressors. Um, so I'm gonna start with coastal resilience and we are so lucky to have um, many practitioners of you know, building more resilient coasts in, in amongst our ranks. And you know, I know Tiffany, you're on the call and you've been a really um, incredible leader in pushing forward um, things like the Resilient Coast Initiative and the West Cliff Adaptation and Man Management Plan and the Beaches Plan that are going into our LCP, our local coastal plan, that will help dictate that next generation of coasts going forward. And there are several opportunities here. Um, and we were fortunate to be a part of that along with um, Central Coast Wetlands Group and um, Integral Corp and a number of partners that worked on that product. Um, so one of the things that this allows us to look towards doing the, um, the thinking about how we adapt our coast, one of the primary, I think, you know, methodologies that we're gonna be able to implement is building living shorelines. And up on the upper right here is our restoration project we have at Seabright Beach. And you can see here this king tide and large swell. Um, you can see how the, the fore dune and the back dune is absorbing um, the waves here. And so that's one thing that we've really worked on doing is you know, figuring out ways where we can make our coastline more resilient to um, to the to rising seas and um, and large swell and um, increased storm intensity and frequency. Uh, and one thing that we try and employ is nature-based adaptation. So to move away from that hardened shorelines and use nature to absorb these stressors. Now that's not possible everywhere, um, but it is in a lot of places, especially if there's a little space along the coast. And, and it's also favored by the agencies. And so where I see this really being um, an opportunity for building green economy in, in the city is through landscape design and integrating natural components along with maybe some of those infrastructural components that are gonna make coastlines more resilient. Another important component is, is building habitat. So, you know, by adding natural elements such as plants, you can, um, you can change uh, the structure of how sand dunes function by their roots and the different species um, penetrate the sand in different ways. And so you can make dunes more stable by choosing your plant palette, but also by animals and um, by enhancing habitat um, for animals. And one of the ways that um, we can do this is by um, using uh, specially designed infrastructure or specially designed um, elements that are incorporated into the infrastructure. And so this is really kind of tweaking nature a little bit with our human side, um, our ingenuity to make it more kind of porous, so to speak, to nature. And um, you know, in, the, in the center here down below is um, Oikonos is a nonprofit locally that does work with um, uh, nest modules and they've been working on Año Nuevo. And then on the right are these um, seabird nesting ledges. And these are some of the recommendations that we've integrated into the West Cliff plan that will go into the S LCP to integrate this kind of habitat along our coast as it retreats and as maybe we harden, we soften at the same time. Um, down below are some techniques in the bottom right of basically increasing rugosity in coastal structures. And so if you do have to harden, how can you soften that hardness? And this is a way of doing it by, you know, creating man-made tide pools, um, creating shelves for limpets to hide under our abalone. And then um, also for building habitat for people, um, on the bottom left is, a, is an image of um, Pleasure Point seawall, and I'm sure you're all well familiar with this. And that was kind of like the first really um, more integrated uh, seawall that we had in Santa Cruz. And there's a lot of room for improvement here, but a couple of things that they did were create places that people can spend time along our coast. And so it's not all vertical, right? There's some horizontal built into the vertical. And these kind of elements make it more porous to people and give people opportunities. And then, and then I also wanted to add in the fact of art into living shorelines. And, um, 
I think that we have a real opportunity to engage artists in this build out. You know, if you look at, for instance, the Pleasure Point seawall, that layout or that the end product does not really fit with the look and feel of the Prisma formation that is along this section of coast. And so I feel like by engaging artists to try and mimic nature in these layouts, we can integrate a look and feel across the landscape that goes along with kind of our ecological identity or our sense of place, it's all being Santa Cruzans along the Monterey Bay. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was wildfire. Um, and we here have a big opportunity for forest management and building healthy forest. I know we have limited amounts of you know, intact forest on city properties, but we do have some places where there is forest and then also within the private sector in, in, in the city limits. And so ways that I feel like we can help manage this is through timber harvest and working with Big Creek, for instance, who are pioneers in sustainable forestry and local um, and have businesses and, and employ people locally in, uh, in their operations. Another one is through fuels reduction. And these are a couple, that's like a, a brontosaurus basically is a big excavator with a mastigator. Um, and these are how we start building like fuel breaks across the landscape. And, um, and then below is, is, is a grinder, so a mulcher. Um, but the fuels reduction is a really important component at strategic places, and there's a big, I think, opening here, again, for integrating technology into this. We haven't even started, I think, that, you know, the, the dawn of the, you know, the robot um, forest managers, are, are it's going to happen. It's really going to happen. And at the scale of problems that we have with our forest right now, these are going to be huge players in allowing us to kind of reboot our forest towards it in a sustainable and resilient direction. And then the big elephant in the closet here is prescribed burns. And if we were to think about a single restoration tool that we have in our tool set along in the Santa Cruz Mountains, it's going to be prescribed burns. Because this whole landscape used to burn regularly and often. Um, and to give an example of kind of how far we, be, we are behind on this, um, I was speaking with BLM the other day. They have, they manage, the Central Coast Office manages 300,000 acres. Last year, they were able to burn 300 acres. So that gives you an idea. And all of this stuff would, you know, at any one given point in time, maybe like 80,000 of those acres would burn annually. And so we are really far behind in prescribed burns. And there's a, there's a big, um, there's a big an opportunity here to work with um, regional organizations um, and to use larger or entities than, than the city to help um, spread their knowledge. So the Santa Cruz District of State Parks is, they're an amazing um, entity. They have great resource managers and they've been doing prescribed fire for many, many years. And so they can provide education that will allow um, groups to burn either on their own lands or in partnership with entities like CAL FIRE or prescribed um, or uh, local fire councils. Um, and then there's also the newly formed Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association. And so these are, this is an entity that's actually providing outreach and engagement and training to individuals right now to use prescribed fire on the landscape. And then within the kind of the concept of prescribed fire, within the thought of rebooting our forest, making it more healthy, and create, creating, um, transitioning from this carbon sequestration more to like a nuts and berries and fruits, which supports and bulbs, which supports greater biodiversity and are, makes forests a better place to be in. We also have the idea of using tech, right? And so um, on the lower right is, a, is an image of a drone, and, and those are actually fireballs that it can drop out and lay out fire across the landscape. And again, I think we're, you know, working with companies that are doing this kind of thing in Santa Cruz, integrating technology with land stewardship and land management is really, you know, from what I can tell, it's, we're not going to do it all by hand. I mean, you, during the fire, a group of us from Davenport got together and we said, we're going to go stop the fire. And people grabbed shovels and then we went and looked out our back window. And I think a couple people went up and dug, you know, a couple feet of land, line, fire line, and then came back and it was just, you know, it was, it's impossible. The magnitude of the scale is huge. Um, 
And then another opportunity I think in the city is thinking about home design, landscaping design, firescaping, home hardening, how we make our, our, our homes more resilient to fire, which you know generates um, many jobs and will continue to generate jobs. And there's gonna be money invested in this. I think Newsom just signed off on um, 530 something million dollars dedicated to um, uh, reducing the impacts of catastrophic wildfire in California. So there's funding coming down the line for this. And I think the city could position it to position itself to to um, be ready to take advantage of some of that. Um, then I want to briefly mention about water, and I think there's another opportunity here from rewatering streams. Really, a lot of our streams are kind of a, a fragment of their former self, right? The San Lorenzo used to have um, renowned steelhead runs, and now it, it barely supports any fish. And so, where, how are ways that we can rewater streams, and how can maybe we do it, you know, while still supporting agriculture, and start to use maybe techniques in agriculture that use less water, or the human consumption part is is massive, right? And so, one thing we can do, you know, as a community, is reduce our water use, and thinking about different ways that we can increase water efficiency. And the, the city can fly, provide incentives and does provide incentives, but I think there's also a big opportunity for technology here. Technology here. And then landscape um, conversion, I think there could be bigger incentives. That's a picture um, of the uh, Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, and we worked with the city and the museum there to convert um, their lawn basically into a coastal prairie. And uh, it's transitioned really, really nicely. Um, and it's a great example of the city. The city actually does have a rebate program for converting your, your lawns, but I think that that could be um, increased and generate more jobs in the landscape industry for that. Um, and then with recycling water, right now we're seeing some big projects in South County with aquifer injection, so taking reclaimed water and putting that back into the aquifer. And I think that's a big opportunity as well for the city to look at and, and, um, and also reuse. Uh, reusing water, and that's something that we haven't, I don't think, um, explored as much as we can um, with the, the city sewage treatment. One thing I wanted to say about um, was rewatering was also thinking about bank storage and how we deal with our streams as they're coming down, and uh, there are opportunities there for creating side channel habitat that also recharges bank, bank, bank storage, which allows more water to sit in the aquifer. So if you have a pump for agriculture or a well that provides city water, such as just up from Highway 1 on San Lorenzo, there'll be more water over a longer period of time to draw on. And then thinking about how we percolate across the landscape, and I think the city's done a good job here of integrating things like these bioswales um, into the build-outs, and I think there could be more incentivization to make sure that 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 happens um, in retrofits, especially. Um, and then, so in thinking about our solutions coming out, um, and the city has been working on this with you know the, the Mission Street corridor and downtown. Densification is really going to be important to us, and that's how we're going to hit Newsom's 30% rule. Really, is by densifying on our landscape. And so, in some ways. Cities can help reduce this impact, right, if they keep people together. But then the trick is to have, how do you integrate ecology into that built environment so people still have this interaction with that? And I think there's a, a big, big opportunity here, one from incentivizing living infrastructure, right? So having living walls, having green roofs, you know, really like maybe regardening the garden mall, right? Um, and, and here there's just a host of partnerships between engineers, landscape designers, horticulturists, ecologists, to try and figure out nature is complex and to figure out the different ways that we can make the, the built environment and nature kind of handshake and dovetail, um, and also to try and make that habitat functional. So not just the green desert, as um, many kind of landscapes is known, are known as, but how do you integrate nuts and seeds and fruits that will then support insects and pollinators and, um, and birds. So in building this, I really think that um, a key thing to do is to use parks as models. And one way we can do that is by utilizing local and native materials across the landscape. So we don't need 
you know, a bright pink piece of plastic on West Cliff. What we could use maybe is a limestone boulder or a redwood log from Big Creek. And then we're taking advantage of them. We're continuing on with that kind of that, what I call ecological identity. Um, and there's room to increase dialogue between federal, state, county, and city NGOs in doing so, so that we can kind of coordinate across the landscape. We're not, we're not creating discontinuity, but creating continuity. And this is going to come in part from developing MOUs to share resources and really sharing them. I mean, it's one thing to say you have an MOU, MOU a memorandum of understanding. It's another thing to actually share those resources across those different agencies. And perhaps one way of doing it is in the, in the name of trying to, say, look at restoration across a regional stretch of coast instead of these artificial boundaries that oftentimes we've created, um, such as, you know, parcel lines, for instance. And then this will increase the connectivity between parks and among parks and allow for more interaction of wildlife and migration, like Andrea was talking about, across the Coyote Valley. Um, and I think another uh, important um, thing is to create and interpret these examples of green infrastructure that can be replicated on private lands so that it just doesn't get put in with no interpretation. But when you implement these things, if you allow people to understand them, that gets the buy-in and that gets the, the next use, the up use, the, the dissemination across the, the landscape was what we're looking for. Um, and so another thing that I think the city can do is really team with some regional emerging programs and it's, it's kind of all about scaling here, right? Like as a city, we're a small portion in a, in a, in a large landscape. And so one example would be working with the Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association. I think at one, some point I would love to see, you know, prescribed burn in Moore Creek, for example. Um, and that would help, you know, create a defense line on the northern end of town where West, Western Drive, for example, with the eucalyptus are highly vulnerable. Um, and then also, this is a new program that I've been working on with the Central Coast Wetlands Group. Um, we've been working with them to build this Monterey Bay Living Shorelines Program. And what this program intends to do is really scale the concept of these small, disparate living shorelines projects bring them together and start recognizing efficiencies. And a big partner here is, this, is uh, state parks because they own over 60% of the Monterey Bay. And so they're kind of a logical entity to work with. I mean, I shouldn't say bay, I should say coastline in the bay. Um, but the Living Shorelines program really seeks to increase connectivity between the different projects, help prioritize them, make sure that we're prioritizing from a needs basis, so are we working at the coastal access points that serve people that need it most, such as the disadvantaged communities in the center part of the day? Those kinds of elements are incorporated into the Living Shorelines program, and then we're also looking at some creative ways of financing that. Um, next, I'd like to mention the Rio California, and this kind of is uh, was created by the California Native Plant Society. I know there's a re -oak Silicon Valley. There are a bunch of re efforts across the landscape, and I think there's an opportunity here to increase habitat under the auspice of oaks, which most people I find um, identify with. Um, and then I think working with the Amamutsu Relearning Program is another way of increasing that connectivity between people and the land, and also for conveying those um, that that native use that is so wise and so time developed in land management and land stewardship. And it's something that I think we could use a lot of scaling with right now. And then learning from agriculture, especially doing a lot of restoration work. Um, I think Reggie, it'd be great to talk to you. I think using agricultural scale techniques to do rest restoration is very intriguing and I think it can be really effective. Oftentimes we don't treat restoration the way that a farmer treats a field, but we're both growing just crops, just different types. Um, and what I would just implore you to do, Council, is, is to um, really invest in the next generation. We work with a lot of schools in education and I think that oftentimes schools are brought to places to experience nature and I think we need to bring nature to the school so that they're immersed in it all the time. And one way to do that is by creating living infrastructure models 
on school campuses. And these don't have to be huge things. There could be a, a bond, for instance, that helps put green walls at schools that students can learn, oh, that's how you put green into this gray. And I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, the other thing is they help, that could help support them thematic learning, and we know that's an effective way for students to learn. And so by creating outdoor spaces with functional habitat, they can see the impact of their work because they're experiencing it every day. And then to engage students in this hands-on design and thinking, which allows them to tackle a problem, design a solution, implement. And then with this, build in an evaluation. And so I think this is a program that could go, you could be bond funded, that could be put across schools. And working with schools myself, I've seen um, at least three schools in city limits be denuded of trees over the last five years rather than gain trees. And instead of new trees that are being put up, I've seen metal structures be put up for shade. And I think we're missing out on an opportunity there. Um, and then of course, supporting stewardship programs, I think, um, but you're well familiar with that. So um, in working together, I think as a, as a council and as a city, um, it's important to support multifunctional public works projects. And so maybe design a flat percent of funds that goes into the ecological element, because oftentimes what we see happen is there's a capital improvement project or a public works project, some percent of money was designated for the face, the ecological facing build out, and the project goes over budget, and then that ecological part gets curved back and dialed back, and it's just a you know like a fraction of its original um, spec. And I think that we can't just keep pulling for it. I understand the need for these public works projects, but they often leave nature batting last. Um, and again, um, integrate local native materials. Um, for instance, rock from the Felton Quarry by granite. So the, the, um, the granite up there is an incredible native material to be able to use in build outs. Um, again, for bonds, I think there's an opportunity for a school's bond. I think there might be one coming up soon. And then also perhaps a coastal enhancement bond um, because we can't float some of these capital infrastructure projects on a one-off um, one uh, basis. And we need to start thinking more strategically, which the, the, um, the Rio Coast Santa Cruz is helping to do. And also think about compensatory mitigation um, how we mitigate for hardening coasts and how those funds go into building out more resilient um, and sustainable ecologies. Um, so with that, I you know also love to form partnerships with the city on funding opportunities and form those with local organizations that are familiar with the landscape and doing boots on the ground work. With that, um, these are just a couple of partners uh, that we've worked with over time and get involved with habitat restoration. Um, thank you very much. Donna, I think you're muted. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank our speakers today. Um, again, um, Three of these organizations are right here in your hometown, in the town that we um, are governing. Um, very inspiring work they're doing globally, statewide. Um, and then Andrea's work really just is, you know, an example of a partnership with a city um, that really has looked at opportunities that really are, have made meaningful impact to community and residents. Um, local food um, security, things like that, that really, you know, job training, the ways that we can um, think about really what we have here, which when I, when I started to kind of think about who should speak, I realized that in many ways we sort of do have ecotopia here. I don't know if any of, of you read that book in the, in the late 80s, but, um, you know, it, it, it's this concept, and it's really the forethought of, of many of the people who really sat in these chairs before us who um, put together our green belt that surrounds our city. Very few cities in the United States have a green belt that surround, literally surrounds their community. And the benefits of that kind of thinking that dates back 30 years, literally, um, we're living with those benefits, but we're also having to acknowledge that that stewardship is really important as we heard from our parks department um, just a few hours ago. So um, 
we are pretty close to time. I want to um, just let the council know sort of the next steps. Um, I would um, love to work with a subcommittee on sort of working out a, a, a set of principles around a resolution. Um, and I have not had enough time to really think my way through about what exactly that subcommittee will do, but I think it is engaging with some of these partners that we have. Um, and I'll, I'll put more together about that uh, and work with staff on, on getting that together in the next um, month or so. But um, really what I think I wanted to accomplish today was again, to give you this perspective of this green economy that we do have here um, and um, really kind of light some a little bit of creativity in your minds and um, look at these opportunities as things that we, we probably don't think this way when we go to the farmer's market every week, that we actually literally have one of the largest urban agriculture um, areas in the, literally in the U.S. I did a lot of research. I mean, we have 60 acres of, of farmland in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we have about 115 uh, neighborhood garden plots that are already available to our community members. So what are the kinds of things we could do? What are the kinds of opportunities, um, you know, most of the work with green jobs is going to be blue collar jobs. They're not going to require a four year college degree or a PhD or any of those other things that some families just can't get, can't do uh, for their kids. So, you know, how do we work with the Workforce Development Board? How do we get involved with Cabrillo College? How do we work from the County Office of Education all the way up? bringing these blue blue collar jobs into the green economy. Um, these are the people that we do see, you know, who have chosen to go into those industries rather than maybe, you know, pursue academia or have the, have the resource to go to, call, you know, get a college degree. So I think we want to, those are the kinds of perspectives that I'm hoping to bring. Um, and I will put a, a note out to council to create a subcommittee to work on these ideas with, again, the goal of some kind of a resolution that can be incorporated into Tiffany's work as she does the climate action plan update, as well as um, just a statement that reflects on the health and all policies, um, policy already, but also cements these things together in our interim recovery plan. Um, we do have a few minutes, and I know everybody's been, it's been a long day, and it's been an emotional day for everybody, I think. Um, but I'm happy if the, if the panel would be willing for 10 minutes if anyone has any questions, and if not, um, that's okay tonight. But um, I mostly want to just give everybody a, a, a big thank you. You guys are amazing. You're doing amazing work. It's very um, inspiring what you're doing. I will open up to council to see if we do have questions, and then I do see one member of the public who does um, want to speak to us for public comment. So I'll just ask if council, member has, if council members have any questions or comments tonight to our speakers. And I'm, I've jammed a lot into a short period of time. So council member Brown. Hi, yes, thank you so much for being here. I don't, I have a million questions for all of you, um, but I, I don't wanna take the time for that at the moment, but I just wanted to say, I really appreciate you being here and sharing your amazing work. Um, some of which I'm more familiar with than others. Hi, Reggie, it's been a while, but good to see you um, and everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, just thinking about uh, as we move forward, um, how it is that we bring your expertise and you know, the people you collaborate with really into this process as we, you know, as we explore and make decisions and strategize. Um, so I hope you'll stick with us um, for the longer haul and, and just really appreciate you being here. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time today. I also really want to acknowledge you, Mayor Myers, for making this a priority for our discussions as we're moving forward, particularly at this unique time with recovery planning and just the prospects of such uh, you know, accelerated movement in these areas. And I also know in-house we have really incredible resources, and I know Tiffany Wise-West is 
here on the call as well. And just really, um, you know, I'm all in. I completely, I, I think this has to be the way that we go for sure. And there's such just a potential for infusion of tech and jobs and future and equity and sustainability collaboration the whole nine. So um, whatever it takes, I hope that we don't lose momentum. And, um, and I'll leave it at that because I think we could have probably had a study session on each and every single one of the things that you uh, presented on this evening. So thank you so much for volunteering your time, but more importantly for the work that you do. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Contari Johnson. Yes, I also wanted to just convey my gratitude for this study session, for all the work that you do and for bringing it to our attention. Um, a, a lot of questions and a lot of areas of excitement, uh, so hopefully to be continued. I'm really, really and particularly excited to see how we can integrate our youth and educating our youth and building workforce development back into elementary, middle, and high school. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Council Member. And Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you so much, Mayor Myers, and thank you to the four speakers. What a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, and I have a lot of questions. I'm hoping to continue the discussions and the connection and to continue the engagement in the process of decisions going forward from this group. And also, my question is, can you share your slide presentations with us? Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Golder. I just wanted to echo the thank yous and the appreciation for all the work that all of you do. And um, I was thinking, having worked at, um, I work at Bayview, is just the connections um, to the different groups that we already do have here in the schools. And so I just think, I echo what um, Council Member Callan Tari Johnson said and really wanna you know, expand on that education and um, youth activation piece in our community. So thank you very, very much. And I look forward to you know working with all of you guys in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so next steps, um, what I'll be doing is I'll, I'll put a note out to everybody. Um, would love to have at least a subcommittee uh, get formed. I'm hoping to pull on some of these folks, maybe not sitting here for two hours with us every time, but uh, again, pulling on these folks and then working with Tiffany and her expertise in what I call the built environment and really kind of wrapping this into sort of this two-faced two, two um, opportunity, um, the yin and the yang of um, really what we have here. And I think, um, I think Bill's reflection on just the way that creative people gravitate to this space, to, to Santa Cruz and people who think creatively and, and are literally working in, you know, a dozen countries and, and, and sitting in their office over in the, you know, in the church at the, at the you know, at the circle. Um, you know, uh, these are things we just don't know about each other and we have this wonderful network of people who are really um, very creatively acknowledging the importance of nature in our community and in our town. And, um, you know, again, people who, who were thinking this way dozens of years ago and we're all living because of those benefits but then um, people like Reggie who are really saying that, you know, and, and, and Andrea saying that, you know, having local food systems right next door, right down your, on your block, you know, available to all ages, um, available and affordable, but also more importantly, getting that training to be successful at that endeavor. You know, that's the piece that where we take this into workforce training and into job opportunities um, I think we heard, you know, between these organizations, um, we have, you know, a number, you know, a couple, a close to at least a hundred jobs created just by these organizations within our within our community. So that's not an insignificant amount of jobs, um, and it's I, I think it's a sector we can continue to grow, and we can be thoughtful about how we um, how we think about deploying our our city resources. So. Um, I just am, again, really thankful for everybody's time. I wanna, again, thank the speakers, uh, friends and colleagues, and we'll pull on them a lot in, in uh, ruminating on this, but I'm determined to try to put something together that we as a city can be proud of in the next year. So thank you again. I'm gonna take it out to public comment 
and uh, we will have more conversations. So, Andrea, Bill, Nick, I'm looking at you guys on the uh, on the uh, Hollywood Squares, and Reggie. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. You guys are true leaders. And, thank uh, you guys. I will, thank you. Thank you. I was I will, gonna get. A, you never get a thank you. It's so much tireless, thankless work. You guys have other jobs too. We deserve to thank you guys because you guys you you go through a lot for our community. So thank you guys. <laughs> Absolutely, second that. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. I'm going to bring it out to public comment now with two minutes left to go. And um, good night, those folks who, who did join us and the speakers. And I'm going to go ahead and take this out for public comment. And I see that uh, we have someone named Steve. Go ahead, Steve. You should be able to unmute and address. This will be for the item on the agenda tonight, which is building a green economy for Santa Cruz. Yes, thank you, um, Mayor Myers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to multitask and promote green jobs while reducing the risk of a suburban forest fire inside the Santa Cruz city limits. That's a good question. That will be something we look at. I think uh, Mr. Henry was sort of alluding to some of those uh, things. So, Steve, thank you. Um, we typically don't uh, take, do dialogue back and forth in public comments, but we will certainly record that comment as something to consider during our, um, during our consideration for the um, upcoming resolution that we'll bring back. And there will be, again, more, uh, more uh, council action on that later in the year. So thank, thank you. you. And my follow-up question is, um, and you don't have to respond, I'm just looking, uh, are you willing to support a video project that encourages kids to pursue the green careers that will help us address this trillion dollar issue? Thank you. Are right. there any? Thank I'll you be in much. touch. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item this evening? Please press star nine on your phone and you will be, well, that will raise your hand. Any other callers that would like to speak at this time? Okay. Well, again, thank you everyone. And uh, we are now adjourned. Have a good evening. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks, Joe. Bye everyone. Hi, thanks. Thank you.